Now at this point, let's dive in and let's look a little bit at .NET as a platform. Okay, that's kind of the underpinnings of what we look at as .NET developers. So let's take a look at what's going on in .NET. And of course, the big thing there, as we've already discovered, is .NET Core. Right? This is a development that's been going on for quite some time. Right? This is not a small effort. This has been going on for years. It is this, this rewrite of .NET. And the question, of course, has to be, well, why even do that, right? Well, what is this new thing, and, and why the heck do we need it? And what does it do for me that the old .NET didn't do? And when you first look at .NET Core, you may actually get the impression that, well, this is just like the old one, right? And, and, and maybe it's missing some stuff. And why would I go this new route when it's missing some stuff? But the key is to understand why Microsoft did all this. When we look at .NET, which .NET in itself is pretty old too, right? I just mentioned Visual Studio, uh, 20 years old. Well, .NET is not that much younger. The first version, the first beta or alpha version of .NET, uh, I think came out in 99. Uh, so, you know, thinking back a little further when this was first conceived, that's 20 years ago, essentially, right? The COM plus objects, as they were called at the time. Uh, so that's a long time ago. I was actually part of the Visual Studio team up in Redmond at the time. And, and there was a lot of very interesting thought went into this, right? Some very, very good things that are really solid to this day, I think. But this fundamental idea of let's build a platform that can execute all the code and let's get away from uh, having a Visual Basic compiler and UI designer and all that and a C++ one and a Visual Fox Pro one and who knows what else, uh, going away from that and just making it a unified platform where you had certain technologies that can be driven from any .NET language. And, you know, that was a huge deal. Getting away from DLL hell and putting everything into a global assembly cache, huge deal at the time, right? And, and certain things are are still very valid today, like the unified language system. Pretty cool, right? But also, when we look at the environment that we had back then, there were a lot of decisions that were just based on completely different scenarios. Back then, you know, the server side of things just became big. The fact that you can actually do serious server side development for web pages. Right, when you, it's not that long ago, 1995 maybe, when we first really got serious about the internet. You know, and then we had ASP, uh, the regular ASP version, right? And then that was kind of a pain to use. And, and so people had just started to discover the, the usefulness of dynamic HTML, server-side generated HTML. Uh, so, you know, having servers that run this stuff, having an ASP.NET web forms runtime environment or, or framework, right? Those things were, were incredible. But they also had some downsides, like they were based on a huge platform that we always installed all or nothing, right? They were based entirely on Windows, of course. They were based, uh, like the ASP.NET stuff was based entirely on IIS. And so, you know, these assumptions today are just not as valid anymore because today, first of all, the platform has grown tremendously. We'd like ways to chop that into pieces, make it more lightweight, especially in cloud-based scenarios. Right, general cloud-based scenarios. That's very, very nice is the ability to split it into smaller packages. So when we then put it on servers and we have to pay for the space and bandwidth and so on we use, it's certainly nice if that's small. Would also be nice if we could side-by-side -side install stuff and that didn't really work so well. Um, and then of course, you know, people like to use platforms other than Windows. So could we fundamentally make .NET work on other platforms? Well, there was a lot of dependencies into the Windows system and on the ASP.NET side into IIS, right? So how do we eliminate all those things? So a lot of the re-envisioning of .NET, uh, which we ultimately came to call .NET Core, uh, has to do with that sort of stuff. And then, of course, you can think that a bit further and you can say, well, not only do we have Linux and do we have Windows, but now we have these mobile devices and couldn't we use that there as well? And so on, all of a sudden, the world appears a whole lot bigger and all the things we can now do, right? So those were some of the things, some of the fundamental thoughts that went into this re-envisioning of the .NET, core .NET runtime and framework and so on. And so that took a few years. Now we have that available, right? 
.NET Core, as we heard earlier, is now released. Uh, has been for a while. Tools have now been released. We'll look into that more a little bit later. Uh, so it's starting to mature a lot. So the framework around it is starting to grow more because that was a problem for a while, right? And so it's really starting to be something that you can use for real. Now I want to give you a quick demo here, and I'm going to start very simple, right? Show you some of the fundamentals. Now some of you are going to say, this is the craziest stuff I've ever seen. Why would I ever use this? But just bear with me here because we'll grow that out. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go into PowerShell here. And as Adam already showed us before, we can go in here and we can run the .NET command and that tells me I have the .NET Core runtime installed, right? So this is this new system. Where did I get that from? Well, you can just install that by going to this uh, somewhat awkward URL, which is .NET really a simple URL, it's just awkward to say in a presentation. But you can go there, you can go and download this runtime system, and once you do that, you then have this, this uh, command line interface, right? So, you know, some of you are gonna look at it and say, why would I ever use the command line, right? We got, you know, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, they're all big about graphical user interfaces, and, and we moved in that direction, well now Steve Jobs is dead and Bill Gates is off saving Africa somewhere. So I guess you can get away with using the CLI again. No, but in all seriousness, uh, there's a lot of scenarios where using a command line interface is really appealing, whether that's automation or just some things are just easier in the command line. So we have that option now, but if you think that's the craziest thing ever, you don't want to do that, not to worry, I'll show you a higher level version of this uh, in a moment here. But so we have uh, the system now installed, so now we can do, start doing stuff with this just here from the command line. So let me just go into a different folder here. And I'm going to make a Sydney folder. Okay, which of course is uh, completely empty at this point. And now I'm going to issue a command here using this .NET CLI, this .NET command line interface. And I can say .NET new. Now depending on the exact version you installed on, uh, you have installed in your system. .NET new will just create a new project, the basically uh, the simplest version of a project, which would be a console app. Or you can actually reference a specific template name. The version I have installed here, when I just do a .NET new, it tells me, hey, I want to know what the template is, which one do you want to use, and it shows me a few here. So let's actually say .NET new console, which will create a new console app for me. Okay, so this is essentially very similar to doing a new project where you're picking a template in Visual Studio, except we can do this completely without Visual Studio at this point. So what did this create for me? Well, this created two very simple files, a program.cs file and, and a csproj file for me. So that's kind of the very minimum that we need in terms of our assets for creating a .NET Core application. Okay? Um, now we could go ahead and we could modify the, the program.cs file that says hello world. Uh, I'll show you in a moment. But for now we'll just run with this. So how could we actually go ahead and run this? How could we essentially do an F5 in Visual Studio? How could we do that here? Uh, well there's this command called .NET run which will build and execute this but we are still missing something else. And that is there's dependencies, right? Dependencies that in the old days might have been in the GAC, the global assembly cache. Now, those dependencies come in as packages. And they can be tiny, right? We can build a very pointed, tiny .NET Core app that only has very specific things in here. And this project, because in the, in the project file, it has some defaults like system.whatever, right? And we can do a .NET restore, and that'll perform a package restore from us. Uh, so this should go relatively quick here, because this is a small project. Here we go. And now that we have that, you know, now we have the object folder here, now we can perform a .NET run. That goes and builds the project for us, just like a build in Visual Studio, and it then immediately runs it, and voila, here we go, it says hello world. Amazingly exciting, right? Well, no, it's not amazingly exciting, I totally get that, but what is exciting is when you think of what we have just done, we built a C-sharp based .NET Core application from the command line, no Visual Studio needed or anything like that. We just installed a small 
uh, runtime installer package. And we then did a complete compilation and built a project that could run on Windows. So that's kind of cool. Now I'm going to do a, a very simple AV switch here, high tech. I'm going to plug this in over here and switch over to my Mac. Okay. And so what I have here on my Mac is I did essentially the same thing that I did in Windows. I went to that dot, dot .NET URL, downloaded the installer package. So there's an install for .NET Core for the Mac. So I installed that here. It's a different install, right, because it's a Mac-based runtime environment, but it's .NET Core for the Mac. So I installed that here, and therefore, I can now go in my Mac terminal and issue the same .NET command here, and I have the same command line interface on the Mac that I used to have or that I have over here on my Windows-based machine. So I already created a Sydney folder. There's nothing in here yet, so we'll do a .NET new Slightly older version, I don't uh, actually pick the console template that's automatic here. So again, I can take a look at this. So we now have a program.cs and a project.json file. So this is the slightly older version. I just haven't updated. I didn't want to update it before I showed a demo, right? I didn't want to risk that. Uh, let's take a look at program.cs. All right, here is that file. Uh, so you see it's just, this would be the same on the PC. We can edit that, console.readline. Been here for three days, so I've learned a little bit of Australian. There we go. Beautiful. All right, done with the editor. Now we do the same .NET restore here. Performs the same exact operation as it would on the PC. In fact, I could have, if I wanted to, I could have just checked the little project I made here on my PC, checked it into, say, GitHub or something like that, pulled it down here on my, my Mac and continued with that. So it literally is the same thing. And so now I can do a .NET run. All right, goes and compiles it, and sure enough, here is my G'day. Is that about right? G'day world? Not so good, is it? Anyway, so it's perfect. I'm ready to immigrate, I think. <laughs> anyway, here it is. So again, very, very simple example, right? About as trivial as it gets, obviously. But when you think of what just happened under the hood, it couldn't be more significant. We are running a .NET app natively on the Mac. Now, it's a super simple app. Don't get me wrong, it's a command line app, and there's users for that. But of course, we want to now spin this example further and do more exciting things with it. But fundamentally, we've now laid the groundwork to do some very, very interesting things. And most importantly, we've broken that Windows wall down, and we can now do this just about anywhere. All right, quick AV switch back here. Back into presentation mode. Okay. So that's at heart what .NET Core is. Now, does it absolutely do everything that the old .NET did? No, it doesn't. Will it ever do everything the old .NET did? No, it will not. Things like WPF, for instance, that are Windows technologies, will not be migrated into this, right? Because why? Right? Would it even make sense to run WPF on a Mac or, or an Android device? Probably not, right? We want different frameworks. So you won't see that move over. But certainly the things that do make sense, like ASP.NET, for instance, the ability to create services, for instance, those have already been migrated into the system, and we'll only see more and more of that in the future. Okay, so very exciting stuff. Now, to give you a little bit of real-world information, that's why we're doing these state.net events, because we're kind of at the center of a lot of information that comes our way because I'm part of so many, net, you know, regional director network, Microsoft MVP network. Uh, we publish a magazine, Code Magazine, they all have copies in the back there. Uh, so we have all the authors, all the readers. So we're at the center point of a lot of things where we hear feedback and we hear about things that work and don't work. And so that's what we want to share at uh, events like this with you. And this is technology that I would say is now really starting to kick in. Right? It's been a while in the making. The very first version of ASP.NET Core, for instance, pretty rough, truth be told. 
right? The tooling, like uh, was uh, mentioned earlier, wasn't there. In fact, the project system changed. If you looked very closely, my Mac app was actually slightly different. It used the project.json file, which was kind of the original version of how .NET Core was reimagined, while my PC over here used a newer version, which used the CS, uh, a C Sharp project file. Because eventually, after we discovered that everyone wanted to use .NET Core, not just the, the ASP.NET guys, was discovered that having a build system that already works, you know, throwing that out would be kind of a bad idea because so much would have to be rebuilt. Um, uh, so it was a little rough, but now with 1.1 kicking in, it's a lot more ready for production, I would say. And we'll take a look at some stuff a little bit later, like containers and so on. Uh, and it's really, really good for that. But for some other stuff, like, you know, should you go out and rewrite your website right now for no other reason than it being on the latest technology? I would not recommend that, right? Hold off a little longer. If I started a new project today, yeah, I'd probably consider it. So that's .NET Core, a first look at that. I want to also mention real brief uh, .NET Standard. I'm not going to go into a big sample here. don't have the time for this here today. But there is a sample of that that you can download that will give you the link for this. Uh, so what is .NET Standard? Uh, essentially, .NET Standard is a continuation of the portable class library idea. So for those of you who have ever written portable class libraries, that's the idea to say, I'll create a DLL, an assembly, that I can use in whatever, WinForms, ASP.NET, .NET Core, Xamarin for Android, whatever, right? It's just a, a, a reusable assembly, typically business logic. Uh, so that was a great idea, but frankly, it was a pain to create those portable class libraries. How many of you have created portable class libraries? Right? One gentleman in the very back, and probably because he had to, right? Um, no, he loved it. That is, you're the first person ever. Congratulations. Uh, no, no, uh, you know, seriousness. Uh, it was a great idea, but it was a little bit of a pain because it was hard to make sure you only used things that worked everywhere, and it was a very limited set. And, and how exactly did you know what that set was? So one of the ideas behind .NET standard is to say, well, let's first of all standardize what that should be. What is a .NET assembly that should run anywhere? Uh, so Microsoft sat down, made that standard, and it's an evolving standard, you know, 1.0, 1.1. We're now at 1.6, and 2.0 is on the horizon. Uh, and so once you have that standard defined, then the people building the runtimes and the compilers can make sure they support that standard. So the full .NET framework guys can make sure that standard is supported. Same with the core guys, same with the Xamarin guys, and so on and so on. Uh, so now we have the standard. Now on the other side of the fence, the Visual Studio guys, the compiler guys, can also make sure they give us a good tooling set for building those types of things. So they give us good standard templates that allow us to create these standard libraries without having to worry about what is supported, what isn't supported. Am I using something that might not work if I build an iOS app, for instance? Uh, so .NET Standard makes that a lot more feasible. I find it a lot nicer to build applications or build assemblies using .NET Standard. And it's going to be really interesting, I think, with .NET Standard 2.0. Why is that so much more interesting? Because it just includes a lot more. Right? So with .NET Standard 2.0, I feel once you get to that point, there's really not that much reason for me to build a, a piece of business logic in a way that would be specific to some platform. Right? Or a service implementation. Do I really need to build that in a way that's not compatible with various platforms? I just build it in .NET Standard 2.0. So that's pretty exciting. And I think uh, definitely with, with version 2, we're going to standardize on that. Right now, you know, try it out. Uh, use the standards. It's just a project template in Visual Studio 2017. Uh, but it's still a little bit limited right now. So that's .NET standard, pretty important. Something I want to mention just a little bit on the side, uh, very interesting development, but very limited availability at this point, and that's .NET native. Uh, that's what the guys use to build the, the Windows Universal apps. So very cool technology. What happens there is when you build a Windows Universal app, you build it on your machine, right? You run it on, in your developer provisioned Windows 10 environment. And then once you're ready to deploy it, you deploy it into the store. And what the store guys do is they take your assembly and they natively compile it through the C++ compiler. 
And it's actually a, an amazing technology because they're able to figure out even, you know, if you do reflection or something like that. And then they compile it down to, an, to a single executable package. Uh, or I think behind the scenes there's actually more than one depending on different configurations. And then when somebody goes to the store and installs your app, they just get that native package. And the advantage of that native package is much uh, lower memory consumption and much faster startup time because the just-in-time compilation, the chit step falls away. So really, really cool technology, but right now relatively limited. All right, how many of you have built uh, universal apps or are doing that? The same poor guy in the back. <laughs> uh, but that's the typical thing that I see, right? We are building uh, universal apps. We've actually put quite a bit of effort into that. Uh, had some tours with the presentations just around that. Uh, but truth be told is it's a niche thing at this point, right? So it fits your needs, great. But I wouldn't tell everybody, you know, abandon your new web development, web app, single page app approach or your WPF approach and just dump it all and start over in universal apps, right? That's not what we are seeing in the marketplace. But if you have a good scenario for it, it's actually a pretty cool platform. It's very likable. Just wish more users used it, right? Um, but so that's what these guys are using. And of course, the implied, I don't have any particular inside information on this or anything, but it's kind of implied that this type of technology might come to a lot of other things, which certainly would be very interesting. So that's why I wanted to mention that on the site. So lots of stuff going on in .NET. Uh, I guess the most important message I have for you is check out .NET Core. I think the time has come where you want to take it serious. And then also look at things like .NET Standard. Uh, those things are certainly quite important.